Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Drs. Melissa R. Michelson and Brian Harrison, co-authors of Transforming Prejudice, Identity, Fear, and Transgender Rights, published by Oxford Press. In this book, the authors examine what tactics are effective in changing public opinion regarding transgender people. Dr. Melissa R. Michelson is a nationally recognized expert on Latino politics, voter mobilization experiments, and LGBTQ rights. She's the award-winning author of six books, including Mobilizing Inclusion, Transforming the Electorate Through Get Out the Vote Campaigns, and most recently, Transforming Prejudice, Identity, Fear, and Transgender Rights. In her spare time, she knits and runs marathons. Dr. Brian Harrison is a political scientist specializing in American politics and public opinion. Brian is currently a lecturer at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Previously, he has served on the faculty of Northwestern University as a visiting fellow at Yale University, an affiliated scholar at New York University, and a visiting assistant professor at Wesleyan University. Before beginning his academic career, Brian was a White House appointee for the Department of Homeland Security. We'll have some time to take audience questions after the talk so please go ahead and put in your questions anytime during the broadcast in the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. You can order your copy of Transforming Prejudice from Books and Books below by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen and every purchase you make keeps Books and Books up and running. So we thank you. And now without further ado, I'd like to bring our guests to the stage. She's going. Whoops. I can't seem to untoggle her video. So uh -oh. you know what? I'm going to go ahead and re-invite you, Melissa. I'm okay. going to close you out. <laughs> okay? The world of virtual events. <laughs> Well, in the meantime, here's the cover. <laughs> if you're wondering what the book looks like. Wow, it's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, I love it. Yay. Hi. Yay. All right. All right. Technology. Well, I was, I was just hold, holding up the book itself. It's available in hardcover and um, paperback. And I was vamping a little bit. And so we were able to welcome Melissa back to the stage. So here we go. Fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Books and Books for allowing us to virtually meet with you and tell you about our work. Um, we're co-authors on multiple projects, so we're used to swapping back and forth. So hopefully we'll be able to do it even though we're not standing next to each other for the handoff of the uh, of the book. I guess whoever's holding the book can talk. You just have to shove it to me through the screen, Brian. Sounds good. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with a little introduction, and then I'll turn it over to Brian to talk about some of the experiments. So this is actually our second book together. We published a book three years ago called Listen, We Need to Talk. And that book focused on the issue of same-sex marriage. And we worked with advocacy organizations all over the country helping them to persuade more Americans to be supportive of same-sex rights. And we started that work in 2009, started to wrap things up in 2014, and of course, as you all know, the Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell in 2015 that same-sex marriage was protected by the U.S. Constitution, at least for now. But as things were wrapping up in 2014, some of the advocacy organizations we were working with started turning their attention to what was considered the next big issue on the LGBTQ rights horizon, and that was transgender rights. 
So as the public was becoming more and more supportive of same-sex marriage, the, the focus of these advocacy organizations and then in turn of our work shifted to the rights of transgender people. And while there is now really very strong support for same-sex marriage, there's not nearly as much support for transgender inclusive policies. There's a lot of fear, uh, a lot of feelings of um, that transgender people are mentally ill, that they are predators, that they are dangerous. In fact, a lot of the stereotypes that used to be held about gay men back in the 1950s now are being used to attack a different segment of the LGBTQ community. And this is especially true for transgender women and even more true for transgender women of color. And we see that in the rates of discrimination that transgender women of color report and in the rates of violence and even homicide against them. Um, their lives are very precarious. Um, and so it's, it's not just that people don't approve of them or don't want to afford them their equal rights, but they are so afraid of them and so disgusted by them that they uh, don't even grant them humanity. And so that's something that we felt very strongly that we wanted to help work on. We wanted to help nudge public opinion to be more supportive. Another thing that's different between gay lesbian rights and transgender rights is that a lot of Americans now realize that they know somebody who identifies as gay or lesbian. And we know that personal contact, interpersonal contact, does a lot to make people more accepting and more likely to want to extend LGBT inclusive policies. But there are far fewer transgender people in the United States to be contacted. And because it is so dangerous, sometimes transgender people don't want to share their gender identity with somebody unless they already know it's going to be safe. So a lot of the shift in public opinion toward gay and lesbian people was because of interpersonal contact and other things, right? But we don't even have that for the transgender population. So what I'm trying to say is that that means there's even more of a need for allies and uh, we consider ourselves allies Right? There's more of a need for allies to be out there trying to shift public opinion to be more inclusive. So that's why we started doing this work starting in 2014. Um, and we came up through that work with an, a, a theory that we call identity reassurance theory. And the idea is that for many people, just the idea of transgender is disturbing. They've grown up thinking that gender is binary and that gender is immutable. You are either male or female. And the idea that that could not be true, uh, and especially for men, that that could not be true, seems to be very threatening to a lot of people. And so it's not, again, it's not like same-sex marriage because people understood the idea that even gay people fall in love and want to have a lifetime commitment and they got used to the idea that same-sex marriages didn't threaten their own opposite-sex marriages. But accepting transgender people and being supportive of transgender inclusive policies, people still feel like that's a threat to who they are, that that's going to hurt them somehow, that they'll have to share bathrooms with people they don't feel comfortable with, that it's going to change um, the sporting world, that it's just it just means that their identity isn't what they thought it was and they find that really um, threatening. And so our strategy with this theory is, well, what if you can reassure people, right? What if you can make them feel secure in their identity? And if you can boost their self-esteem and make them feel good about who they are and their values and cue those underlying values that people have about equality and being good to other people, that you can get them to be more open to supporting transgender rights. So we test this theory with a variety of experiments in the book. We are not going to tell you about all of the experiments because then you wouldn't buy the book. Uh, but also we don't have time because there's really quite a lot of detail in how we came to this. But I am going to tag team my co-author Brian now to tell you about a couple of those fabulous experiments. Thanks, Melissa. That was a great introduction. So, so, as Melissa mentioned, we developed the identity reassurance theory. 
out of a need for a different theory than what we recommended for LGBTQ people and rights. And just to make sure that that, that was accurate, we tested our theory that worked so well in our last book, which you can also buy at Books and Books, by the way, from 2017, that showed that identity leaders um, and identity cues can um, harness the power of shared identity and that can make people more and more supportive of marriage equality. So we did one experiment uh, to, make, to make sure that that theory did or did not work for transgender folks. Now, before I jump into that experiment, what are experiments in the first place? So they're commonly used in the biological sciences um, and they're, it's, it's most akin to the idea of if you have 100 people you randomize them into two groups of 50 and everyone has an equal chance in being one of the two groups. You give one group a, um, a drug, you give another one a placebo, and then you see what happens. And anything that happens subsequently, you know, is due to what you did to the two groups because they were randomized and it controls for all sorts of other things that could be going on. And within the last 20 years or so, that technique has been used in social science more and more. And that is our technique of choice. Um, and you can do experiments in a whole bunch of ways. You can do them in a lab, just like you might expect in a, in a biology lab or a chemistry lab, but you can also do them um, in surveys. You can randomize the order of questions or you can randomize which questions precede which. And, um, all in an effort to, to make sure that you can you can measure this causal impact, that what you are saying, what you are doing, actually has the desired effect that you that you'd like. You can also do field experiments, which Melissa will we'll talk about in, in a little bit, which she mentions one that we did on Halloween, which is good timing on, on our part. Um, but experiments really give us the ability to have a level of control to be able to say beyond the shadow of a doubt this message or this image or this treatment, whatever it might be, has a causal impact. This is the thing that changes people's minds. And that is a very powerful um, a mechanism for us to use when a lot of things that you might see or read, polls or surveys are not experiments and they can certainly be instructive, but we went the extra step and to do experiments to have that extra causal link. So anyway, we tested what we, what we call in the book, the Jack Reed experiment. And what this was about was uh, appealing to folks who are in the military and saying, Jack Reed is a um, former member of the military. Um, he's also, we, we, we call him a Democrat or a Republican. He's actually a Democrat, but we lied a little bit. Um, and what we, what we wanted to know was, can Jack Reed serve as an opinion leader among the identity group that we are talking about, so much so that he affects public opinion about transgender people, even though he himself is not transgender. That's essentially the theory from our 2017 book. And what we found was not really. Uh, there was some movement, uh, particularly among veterans, um, but generally speaking, it didn't work as, as we had thought. So we, as Melissa mentioned, came back to what really is going on here? Why are people opposed to transgender rights? And what is it that we can manipulate, or in scientific terms, what treatment can we give folks to try to get them to be more supportive of transgender people and rights? And as she mentioned, the, the identity reassurance theory gave us the underpinnings for what we could test and what we could try to get folks to be more supportive of transgender rights. So in a, in a series of studies like this, when we are testing whether you can reassure identity. What we did in a lot of the experiments is randomize which identity that we were uh, appealing to and how we were doing that. And the, one of the, I think probably the most interesting experiments to me at least, come when we test um, threat to masculinity and threat, uh, threat to femininity. We have a chapter that looks at the impact of toxic masculinity and how increasing the sense of um, masculinity threat among people has been shown to make others more transphobic, more homophobic. Um, it also makes people more likely to like buy sports cars in midlife, but that's not what we're testing here. So what we did was we ran an experiment where we had a group of people that were randomized into two groups 
And we knew ahead of time which identified as male and which identified as female. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to threaten the identity of some men and not others, threaten the identity of some women, but not others, and look at the difference between those who had this their identity threatened and those who didn't to see if they were more or less supportive of transgender rights. And before we started, what we really thought was going to happen was men would be particularly susceptible to these threats. Men who have their masculinity threatened and men for whom their masculinity was important to them, is important to who they are as a person, would be particularly affected by a threat. Um, we, we thought conversely, women probably wouldn't be affected nearly as much, mainly because um, there is not really such thing as toxic femininity, as far as we know. Um, so we went with the idea that toxic masculinity does in fact make people more transphobic. So what we did was we gave people a survey that is meant to measure how masculine or feminine they are. And it's a, it's a scale that's been used by people for over the last decade or two in psychology. And they took the real test. It was a battery of about 40 questions or so. And at the end, they're given a score. They were either told they were uh, very masculine or not. And so for men, they were told, you know, you took this, you took this battery of questions. Your results suggest you are very masculine um, compared to other people. And women were told the same. You're very um, feminine in, in relation to other people who have taken this test. And again, what we thought was men who had their masculinity threatened would be more self-conscious, would be would have their ego or their sense of self more uh, more upset, and that would lead to less supportive attitudes and behaviors about transgender people and rights. We didn't think that women would have such a problem um, given that same threat condition. And what we found was indeed men who had their masculinity threatened were in fact less supportive of transgender people and rights. Um, we tested it in a, in a couple of different ways, but what we found was they were less supportive of the, the military, uh, transgender service in the military. They were less supportive of um, bathroom access for transgender people to use the bathroom that aligns with, with their comfort and with their identity. And we also found that people, if you ask them how they would vote in a potential future election or a future ballot initiative, they were more likely to vote against uh, something that would help the transgender community. Now again, no effect on, on the, the women, the women who were threatened or not, but it was the start of thinking about identity as something that wasn't just about the transgender person. It, it's more, is probably more so about the respondent and not just the transgender person. So that broadened our thinking a little bit and got us to thinking, okay, if you can threaten someone's identity and it makes them more transphobic, maybe you can do the opposite. If you can bolster or reinforce their, their identity that's important to them, maybe they'll feel even more comfortable um, with themselves and not judge so harshly people who are in a different uh, identity group or community. So we did the same exact experiment that I just described, except we did the opposite. We told people um, rather than having low levels of masculinity in the male condition, we said, wow, you are super masculine. You are wildly more masculine than the average person who took this test. Thinking that maybe if we could bolster someone's self-confidence or self-esteem in a particularly prominent identity, they would not, again, um, be opposed to the rights of people who are not in their identity group. And it didn't really work. Um, it worked in a few ways. But generally speaking, identity bolstering did not work as well as identity threat. And that was, I think, a pretty important finding that it shows that uh, masculinity itself, when uh, it sort of runs rampant and lets people um, be more concerned with how they're perceived than the rights of others, it can be a particularly damaging situation for transgender people. Uh, and that's just one example of a survey, or I'm sorry, an experiment that we did. Um, we did a few others. We looked particularly at emotion. As Melissa mentioned, disgust is a particularly common emotion when you ask people what they think or feel about transgender rights. And so, re again, relying on social psychology, we delved into um, how emotion and, and how uh, sort of manipulating emotion can change public opinion and attitudes, again, towards transgender people and rights. 
And I'll mention one experiment before turning it over to Melissa. But one emotional experiment we did was um, we looked at the effect of showing people um, different pictures, different images that were meant to invoke different feelings. And in uh, our chapter on emotion, we rely on social psychologists to tell us, okay, this emotion should have positive affect, which should then lead to positive behavior. These emotions, uh, conversely, are more likely to uh, scare people or to dissuade them from, from um, doing good things and are more likely to cause them to be afraid of people who are different than they are. So um, Melissa will describe a couple of those experiments where we used the power of emotion in hopefully the right direction. Thanks, Brian. So the first experiment we did with emotion is we asked people to rate a series of 10 photos of cute puppies, tell us how cute this puppy is, or a set of scary spiders, which seems very appropriate to the pre-Halloween um, season. How scary are these spiders, right? And so in theory, the people who look at the cute puppies, right, we don't really care who wins the puppy cuteness contest. What we care about is, oh, oh, and then people are happy because they got to rate the puppies, right? And then the people who are rating the scariness of the spiders are feeling a little creeped out because they just looked at a series of photos of really very large furry spiders, which most people find scary, right? And it's true that when we asked people after rating the photos of the puppies or the spiders, people who had rated the puppies were in a much better mood, feeling a lot happier, right? All is good in the world. People who rated the spiders, not so much. And then we said, okay, now for something completely different. Now we want to ask you about transgender rights. And again, um, it was consistent with our hypotheses, right? So the people who were now in a good mood because they had just looked at a bunch of puppy photos, they were more supportive of transgender rights, transgender inclusive policies. The people who just looked at spiders and were not, not in such a good mood were less likely to support those policies. So it worked, right? We manipulated people's emotions and we got them to change their attitudes toward transgen transgender rights. The problem or the, uh, the, the limiting factor of that experiment, of course, is it doesn't really work in the real world to just constantly send people pictures of cute puppies and kittens and rainbows and unicorns to keep them in a good mood, right? Uh, we need people to be, um, we, th it's just not a very practical way of moving public opinion, right? Um, so if we wanna give information to advocacy groups or to people who wanna be allies, that's not really useful information, right? So we did another experiment with emotion where we triggered a less well-known emotion called moral elevation. Moral elevation is that feeling you get when you see people doing something heroic and selfless and you're just like, wow, I just, I love humanity. Everything is fabulous. People are good, right? Um, so, for example, we showed people a two-minute video of the subway hero, the Harlem hero. This was a man who was standing on a subway platform in New York City, and another man next to him suffered a seizure and fell onto the tracks just as a train was coming. And despite the fact that the observing man had his two young daughters with him, four and six years old, with him on the subway platform, he jumped into the train, uh, down onto the tracks, covered the other man's body with his own and laid on top of him between the tracks and then the subway car went over them. And it was so close to his head that it got grease on his hat. So he risked his life to save a stranger, right? Uh, really selfless act that, like just telling you the story now, I'm getting chills, right? And you're just like, wow, that is amazing, right? So it's this feeling of moral elevation. And when you hear stories about moral elevation, when you are feeling moral elevation, it makes you want to be that kind of person, right? You want to think, yeah, I'd be the person who would jump. I'd be the person who would 
help somebody in need, even a stranger, I'd be the person who would risk myself or give up something of myself, right? And if you can get people in that sort of mood, if you can evoke that emotion, then you really can shift attitudes. So we showed people, we randomized people into watching one of six videos. Three of them were moral elevation videos. Two of them were videos just meant to put them in a good mood, kind of like the puppies, right? So for example, about a roller coaster ride. And then one was the baseline or the placebo video, which was a very boring video about how to make a flute, which I, I hope I did not offend any flautists, but for most people, it's not the most entertaining video. And sure enough, if you were in the moral elevation condition and you watched one of these stories about selflessness and people being fabulous, you were much more likely to be supportive of transgender rights, much more supportive of transgender people, right? And that's the kind of information that you can really use. And you'll notice if you've seen any PSAs that come out from transgender advocacy groups, like the Movement Advancement Pro Project, they use this strategy of showing people like, here's how you can help. Here's how you can stand up and help. Oh, are you in a restaurant and the waiter owner is is blocking a transgender woman from using the bathroom and it looks like if she goes in the men's bathroom that would be dangerous for her? You can stand up, right? You can be an upstander, not a bystander, as the kids say. And you can go help make sure that that woman goes into the women's restroom and is safe, right? And so that's the kind of emotional appeal that can actually be useful for nudging people. So that that was fabulous, but it is not my favorite experiment from the book. And as Brian previewed for you, I must tell you about the Halloween experiment, which is by far the my favorite experiment in the book because we did it on Halloween. And by we, I mean me and my parents. So I went to my parents' house. They live on a street in their neighborhood that is the Halloween street in non-COVID times, right? The street where there's thousands of people, every house is decked out with the most ridiculous amount of decorations. You have to buy a thousand candy bars or if you're gonna even hope to get through to just nine o'clock, right? So it's a, it's a huge thing. And so I'm like, hey, if a lot of people are gonna be walking by my parents' house, you know, they can give uh, candy and I'm gonna get data. So my parents and I stood outside their house from 3.30 to 9.30 on Halloween two years ago. And we conducted an experiment that tested a journey story. So a journey story is giving people an example of somebody going through a journey. And in this case, the story is a journey of a mom who took a journey where she changed her mind about transgender people once she found out that her child identified as transgender. So before this happened to her, she did not think transgender was a real thing. She did not support transgender rights. She thought it was a mental illness. Then her child says, mom, I'm a girl. And as she realizes that this is real and that her daughter is in fact her daughter, not her son, she changes her attitude about transgender people. And so we share the story in the treatment condition with people. In the control condition, we just told them, this is what transgender means, so just like a definition. So everyone's getting exposed to an image and to a little story, and then they have to answer a bunch of questions. And so we did it with pieces of paper because it, this is a field experiment. So my parents and I are out in the field of their front lawn, right? Um, their neighborhood is uh, highly Latinx, and so the survey was bilingual. It was English on one side and Spanish on the other. And we recruited people to take the survey with $2 dunking cards. So um, I really wish I could, I wish I had video to show you my parents flagging down passersby and telling them to get a survey and get a dunking card. Um, so we collected the data, um, we had a fabulous time, and then it turned out that it worked. Right. So the, the folks who were randomly assigned to get the survey with the journey story were less likely to think that transgender was an illness, more likely it that it was something that you were born as and more supportive of transgender rights. Right. Versus the people in the control group. So um, I love this experiment because my parents got to help me. I also love it because it's a great example for people who 
just want to do science at home, right? You don't need a lot of money. You don't need a lab. You just need, you know, a couple hundred Dunkin' Donuts cards, these $2 Dunkin' cards, and you can go out and collect some data and have a lot of fun doing it. Um, but more importantly for the book and for the theory and like research, right, it worked. If you give people a journey story, it gives them permission to go on a journey, right? And this is something that you can use as an ally, that you can say to people, yeah, I used to feel uncomfortable about transgender people, but you know what? I'm okay with it now and I've changed my mind. And again, this is something you see advocacy organizations using, right? In North Carolina, a few years ago, there was a pretty well-known ad pushing back against Amendment 2, where a coworker is walking with, uh, some coworkers are walking and one turns to the other and said, when I first found out Zeke was transgender, I was a little uncomfortable. And they have a little conversation and they talk about how this woman changed her mind, right? So again, it's, it's giving permission. It's saying, it's okay to be uncomfortable, but you can change your mind and you can be that kind of person who is accepting and supportive of transgender people. Come on this journey. Other people have taken it. It's gonna be okay. Um, so that that's the Halloween experiment is the journey story. I feel like I should turn it back to Brian. Sure. So that's just that is just uh, a few examples of how you can actually measure and test uh, the identity reassurance theory that we have in the book. But on a more broad scale, when we started the book, we really wanted to find the perfect thing that would change everyone's mind to be supportive of transgender people, right? If we could only find the right message, the right messenger, the right medium, the right time, if we can sort of get all those factors at play and find the optimal way, we can just convince everyone's, convince everyone to, to change their minds. Not really, we, we know better than that, but my point is, we wish that we had a panacea that we could just change people's opinions and be more supportive of transgender people and rights. But that's an unrealistic expectation. Um, as Melissa mentioned, particularly given the arc of um, rights in the rights and opinion in the 20th century, um, there's a, a well-known documentary in the late 1960s that Mike Wallace did on CBS that is called The Homosexuals. And it was done to be a documentary about what life was like for what they call the average homosexual. And they thought they were being very uh, even-handed and unbiased. So this newscast was about gay men being lecherous predators, um, not able to have meaningful conversations, um, being deviants, uh, being sick, sort of all of the, the awful stereotypes that you can imagine from the middle of the 20th century. And imagine at that point in time saying, hey, gay people should be able to get married. People would laugh at you. They would say, what in the world are you talking about? It wasn't the right time to, to, to talk about marriage equality in the 1960s or 70s or 80s or 90s or 2000s. Um, public opinion changed over time and it took a while. It took a while for people to realize that this identity group that they may have feared or, or been disgusted by actually isn't someone that they should fear and isn't someone that they should ostracize in the ways that they had previously. And over those decades of work, public opinion finally got to a place where marriage equality, for example, could happen because people weren't so afraid, they weren't so disgusted. And they were able to, lo to look at this out group as a group of people who are deserving of rights, the same rights that they themselves had. Now, transgender people are not at that same point. Um, unfortunately, we are still in the earlier cycle, as Melissa mentioned, for transgender people, where many feel and think transgender people are sick or deviant or predators, or again, all of these awful stereotypes that you could imagine. And as much as we wanted to write the book that changed everyone's mind, we quickly came to, to see that we were in that earlier stage. And what we had to do was make people feel more comfortable with themselves and as a byproduct, make them feel more comfortable with transgender people. And hopefully in the not so distant future, we're, we're gonna be able to take those next steps and to say, yes, let's have employment non-discrimination. Let's have um, positive and affirming healthcare for everyone. Let's, let's do some of these changes, let's make some of these changes that the transgender community requires and demands and is owed. 
but we're not quite there yet. So some of the ways that we try to nudge people in the right direction to make them feel more comfortable with themselves um, in relation to the identity reassurance theory was, was to bolster or to threaten identity to see how that affected the way people felt about themselves and subsequently how they felt about others. But then we expanded, as Melissa mentioned, into ways that we can put people in a frame of mind where they are more likely to be respectful, more likely to listen to information that is given to them, and more likely to give themselves permission to look at the values and the positive attributes of people who may have made a similar journey that they need, they themselves need to make. And so sort of in conclusion, as, as we get ready for some questions, um, this isn't the end, obviously. This isn't the answer to all of the questions of how to persuade folks on transgender rights, but we view it really as a beginning to say identity and identity comfort is really important. And before we can make people comfortable with transgender people and transgender rights, we really need to make sure that they are comfortable with themselves. And th those two processes are interrelated. And the book uh, measures a whole bunch of interesting and what we think are scalable and reasonable ways to try to get people to be more comfortable with themselves before they're able to be comfortable with the out group, which is transgender people. So hopefully we have some questions. I don't know how that works. Where's our host? <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Oh my God, so fascinating conversation. Yay, thank you. Thank um, you. So can you comment about the recent um, statements that JK Rowling has made? Do you know, have you followed that story? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that um, a little bit and how to how we might focus that? Sure. She, uh, J.K. Rowling has made a series of um, transphobic and dismissive, I think they're all tweets, um, over the course of um, several months, if not years. And at first, people sort of misunderstood and said, well, surely I'm not um, interpreting your words correctly. You can't be this overtly transphobic. And with all of the opportunities that J.K. Rowling has at her disposal, she could have said, no, this is what I meant. But rather, she doubled down and said, nope, that's what I think. Um, I don't, she essentially said, I don't think being transgender is a valid identity. I don't think that it is something that we should celebrate and continue to double down on this pretty transphobic and awful attitude. And the backlash was slow at first, but it accelerated pretty quickly. And a lot of people who, myself included, was a Harry Potter fan are now looking at the books on their shelf saying, gosh, I don't know if I should really support this person who is, um, you know, not this, the supportive, um, open-minded author that, that I once thought she was. And but I think I'll what maybe, Brian, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I think maybe what this points out is it's not just men, right? I mean, we did... We do know that men tend to be the ones who are less supportive, um, but women can be less supportive too. And there's also, uh, you know, a community of women, people who think that saying that transgender women are women is a threat to them as women, right? Um, if you think about just the bathrooms issue, right? That women had to fight for segregated public bathrooms so that they could go out of the house and have a safe place to go and the idea now that that safe place is being opened up to what they do not consider to be women and that they consider to be making them less safe makes them unsupportive of transgender bathroom access rights, right? Uh, the young women who are athletes who are now um, competing in sports and maybe winning championships, um, such as in Connecticut with the track runners, um, or in wrestling, right? That makes people feel like, well, we can't, um, transgender people are, are a threat to me and they're a threat to girls and they're a threat to women. And and so it, it is not the same thing as toxic masculinity and it's definitely not as widespread that women are opposed to transgender rights. But I think that JK Rowling felt comfortable being transphobic, uh, that she felt 
so secure in her thoughts that she not only made these transphobic treats, but she wrote a whole transphobic book where the transgender person is the bad guy. It's just uh, a sign of how much work there is to do and how much the, the world, the, the United States and the world needs people to stand up and say, that's not okay. And whether that means declining to reread your Harry Potter books um, and turning to some different um, fantasy or um, tweeting something at JK Rowling that people need to stand up and say, no, I'm not okay with that. Cause there's a lot of people who aren't even worried about saying it. It's not even politically incorrect enough. And so people with huge platforms are willing to go out and say those sorts of things um, and feel like there will be enough folks who agree with them that it's, that it's safe. Uh, I think that is a sign of how much work there is to do and how much uh, everyone who supports transgender rights needs to speak up. I also think it, it um, alludes to how information doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. So if you can say to someone, okay, you're transphobic, you're against transgender rights, I understand that you feel unsafe in ba in public bathrooms, but did you know that it is very is vanishingly rare that there is a sexual assault in a bathroom that is perpetrated by a transgender person? I mean, counting on one hand over several decades in the United States, how many uh, attacks there have been in bathrooms, um, that isn't necessarily persuasive to some people because as Melissa said, this is a threat to their identity. It isn't just a threat to their bathroom usage. So what we found in the book is, if you can look at look at um, the situation from a more ad identity oriented standpoint and say, okay, this isn't just about safety; it's about something larger than that. And you can try to engage people on that level. You're far more likely to have success in changing their minds. Uh, what can people do? Like, what are some of the like simple daily steps that people who want to be supportive can do? Yes, I love this question. Everyone can help. Everyone can stand up and have conversations with people. Um, so when somebody says something, um, you know, in response to something that happened to them or something they saw online, um, or just, you know, during a dinner conversation, bring it up, right? Um, one of the reasons, again, that attitudes towards same-sex marriage changed so rapidly is because it became a topic of conversation. And the more conversation there was about it, the more opportunities there were for persuasion. And so one of the ways to shift attitudes about transgender rights is to bring it up with people and to, you know, however you want to start it. Hey, did you hear about that new book that JK Rowling wrote? Or, wow, did you see that Supreme Court decision in Bostock? Or whatever it is, you know, find a way to start the conversation. And if somebody says something transphobic, say, hey, why do you feel that way? Let's talk about that, right? So you have to have a conversation which, which doesn't threaten people, that reassures them that they are a good person, but calls on them to you know, get in touch with their better values. Um, and it, it also helps, again, to use some of the strategies we talk about in the book. For example, the journey story, right? I think it's very helpful to give people that permission to say, you know, before I knew more about this, I, I wasn't so sure about transgender people. I was uncomfortable. Um, or if that's not true, share a journey story that somebody else has taken. Give them that permission to change their mind as well. Uh, but I think the, the number one piece of advice I have for people is start the conversation. Don't be afraid to have that conversation yeah, it might be a little uncomfortable, but think of all the good you could do. Since I'm all about self-promotion, I have another book, which is here, that came out in April, which you could also buy at Books at Books, um, that really walks people through how to have difficult and contentious uh, conversations about politics and other social issues. And I think Melissa is exactly right. Um, finding the right way to approach, even if you don't know if it's the right way, but just to try it and to go ahead and do it. Um, I will add, and it's really hard these days when the president of the United States is one of the biggest bullies in the world, especially on Twitter, it feels good to, um, to shame other people to make them feel less than if they have a, uh, an opinion that's different than yours. And I found that to be true um, when it comes to LGBTQ rights as well. 
So if someone says something to you that they don't support transgender people or rights, um, it would feel it could feel really good to say, well, what an ignorant thing to say. How dare you think that um, and really go on the defensive. But social social psychology and our, our work shows that that's not the best way to do it. Um, if you can listen to people, if you can uh, find a way to engage with them on a level that they really embrace, that is the best way to, to, to try to change hearts and minds. It is not very satisfying. It's far more satisfying than to, to you know have a great comeback and to tweet something mean at them and feel better about yourself temporarily. But one of the best ways to engage with people who disagree with you is unfortunately one of the hardest, which is to have patience, to take a breath, and to sort of take a leap into a conversation that might be uncomfortable, even if you don't feel like you know how to do it perfectly. Can you hold that book up again, please? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Or as long as you'd like. A change is going to come. Okay, great, great. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, someone asks, what is the difference between queer and transgender? Can Good you question. explain? Sure. So, transgender is the opposite of a word called cisgender. Most people. Um, when they're born are assigned a gender, um, or I'm sorry, are, are, are assigned a sex based on their anatomy. The doctor looks at them and says, okay, this is the way you look, this is your sex. And as the baby grows up, they develop a gender identity that is the same. So if you're born male, you identify as male later in life, your sex and your gender match. But that's not everyone. There are other identities, including um, intersex, um, and a whole range of other identities that aren't quite uh, cut and dry as male or female. And in addition, your sex and gender identity may be different. So you may be born and the doctor looks at the baby and says you're male, but as the child grows up and as they um, make sense of the world around them and they really come to see who they are, they realize that despite the way that they might look, they really identify and feel as if they are female. And that person is uh, transgender, that their sex that they were assigned at birth is not the same as the way that they identify later in life. And that people can be transgender female, which means they were assigned male at birth, but identify as female. They can be transgender male, which is the opposite, born uh, assigned a female sex, but later in life identifying as male. Uh, but generally, transgender is this mismatch between sex and gender. Queer is a different term that um, relates more to sexual orientation than gender identity, but it's an all-inclusive term that suggests that someone doesn't necessarily want a label put on their uh, sexual orientation um, and their gender identity. It's more an expression that uh, someone doesn't want to adhere to uh, categories and doesn't want to put themselves in one um, one specific category of, of person. But what queer identifies is someone who does not identify as heterosexual. So queer is an all-encompassing term, essentially meaning not straight, for someone who doesn't feel like they fit into some of, some of the traditional paradigms and some of the traditional definitions that we tend to use in American culture. Okay. Um, are there any works of fiction that you have read lately, novels um, that have, that can help other people understand through characters and through stories, uh, some of these, um, some of these themes, I guess. Melissa? I can't think of fiction off the top of my head, but I found a very powerful book that is a, a, a nonfiction story is Becoming Nicole. That's a very uh, beautiful book about uh, a young woman becoming Nicole um, and also about her twin brother who, you know, was experiencing her coming out. So, so the brother is part of the story as well and, and how he is affected by the fact that it turns out that his sister is his sister. Um, that's a really uh, beautiful story, but it's not fiction. 
Uh, I think I tend to read more nonfiction. Maybe Brian has a suggestion. I do, but I can't remember the title, which is not helpful. Um, but there's a book that actually my um, my kids school read as a book club book. And it was all, all of the parents who participated read it, myself included, but it was almost two years ago and I can't think of the title. But no, I had it and I lost it. Anyway, it was it was um, it was a story about a transgender child and sort of the experiences that that they went through and the nuances of family and school. And um, it was a wonderful book. And I'm sorry that I can't think of it. I know that they're out there. Um, there's also a lot of and I know this doesn't help books and books necessarily, but there's a lot of television and a lot of movies, mm -hmm. a lot of examples of positive portrayals of transgender folks. For a long time, and we write about this in the book, um, transgender people who were portrayed in the media were all sex workers or drug addicts or um, in some way the, sort of an, a nefarious character. There were no such things as positive portrayals in media. And the same, I would imagine, is true for fiction and for nonfiction. But luckily, there are a whole bunch of uh, examples, even within the last few years, of more positive portrayals that more realistically show how transgender people live. And um, that's a great thing because we know that that reading um, and seeing these other stories can have a profound effect on people. It feels like there's a huge movement in publishing in general to allow for some of these voices um, and this diversity to enter into the mainstream. So I hope it continues. Um, so I would like to ask you, what do you, what do you want people to take from your book? What are your what are your hopes and goals for this book in particular? I hope I hope people will act. I hope people will say I could help. I can do that, right? Because you know we talked a lot about the experiments, but I'm I'm really glad that somebody asked about what can I do because that is the takeaway that we try to leave people with is you can be a superhero for justice and equality. You can help. You can get out there and you can start conversations with people you know, your friends and family, uh, and you can help. And, um, you know, we all do too much doom scrolling. And maybe instead of refreshing your feed, you should go have a conversation with somebody. Um, you know, we don't, we don't interact with people that much these days because we're all uh, living through a pandemic. But there's still, I think, opportunities to interact with people and to bring things up and maybe Maybe transgender rights isn't the thing that you want to have a, a difficult conversation with somebody about. Maybe it's climate change. Um, maybe it's um, reproductive rights. Um, whatever it is, these same tools work to open people up to, to reconsidering their positions and to changing their minds. And if you use the tools that we talk about in the book, you can have productive conversations that allow you to help make the world a better place and then you'll get that sense of moral elevation, right? You might not have jumped on the subway tracks, but you've done something besides, you know. Absolutely, reading. absolutely, sure. I mean, I think um, we're with you all the way at indie bookstores, you know. That